Hello and welcome to BTC Sportsline. I'm your host Michelle and this is my co-host Ray. As many of you may know, the NBA Finals are going on this month and we're here to discuss all the highs and lows throughout games 1, 2, and 3, as well as all things Mariners and we will be touching base with the Seahawks and what has been happening with their OTAs. But before we get to all of that, let's take a quick look at the NBA Finals and the matchup between the defending champions, the Golden State Warriors, and the Cleveland Cavaliers. With the Warriors sitting on top of the series so far with a 2-1 lead over the Cavs, here are some quick highlights through three games. Welcome to Oakland, California. Allen. Hustle by Love. Green, alley up to Bogut. Team defense in that they really shrunk the court and made it hard. Barbosa! Iguodala guarding, knocked it away again. Curry, Thompson. Battling back from 14 down. Nice feed inside and dream on green. Team two. The last six years, the NBA. James posting up. Green up to Bogut. Bogut right back to Curry. Gorgeous feet inside. And is the primary defender. James goes right at him, blocked by Bogut. Good defense, poke it away, force the turnover. James bounce pass to Thompson, blocked by Bogut. His third already. Here comes Curry for three. Love trying to post up Draymond Green. Blocked again by Bogut. Four rejections. Cleveland, Ohio, with a 2016 NBA final. Irving, little hesitation. Jefferson for three. Curry is on Jefferson, looks to take advantage, but can't. Bogut altered it, but the follow there from Thompson. Thompson against Thompson. Clay drives on Tristan and finishes beautifully. Nice back door, and James throws it down. Got to play better. Turns it over. James keeps his dribble somehow. Irving back to James. Oh, he throws it down. Well, looking at those highlights, Ray, it's easy to say the Warriors are going to walk away with another championship again, right? I mean, the Cavs just can't seem to match up with the depth that the Warriors, that the Warriors possess. And there's something in that old saying that there's strength in numbers. Well, I, I do see the Cavs actually putting up a little bit of a fight. They're supposed to win their games at home. Uh, in any seven game series. Uh, the Golden State Warriors came off completely off last game, so I don't see them playing that bad ever again in this series. Uh, they're the defending champions, set the NBA record for most games won in a season. They are the team to beat. Um, Steph Curry looked so off, it was unbelievable. Well, minus the, po the performance of game three, the big three of the Cavs hasn't been so big. Uh, with Love getting hurt and leaving in game two, Kyrie and LeBron causing so many costly turnovers, why is it that they looked so strong in the Eastern playoffs, but they, uh, they're just not really looking that strong now? Is the, is the Eastern Conference really that weak? Well, comparatively speaking, the Eastern Conference is below standard as far as the overall NBA goes. Um, only the Cavaliers really stack up in probably the top eight teams in the, in the NBA. Uh, the rest of them are seated in the Western Conference. Um, as you can see by the playoff run by the Warriors, they, they had tough battles with both Portland and with uh, OKC. Um, and fought them both out and won in decisive manner by the end. The Cavaliers have pretty much just been able to walk on through, so they really aren't battle-tested through these playoffs yet. That's a good point, because they almost went undefeated in the playoffs on their side of the conference, and so they didn't really have that, that uh, pressure you know, put on them. They, and so now that they're having that pressure, how are they going to perform? How are they going to stand up to that pressure? Are they going to be able to do it? Well, in Game 3, they did. They came out... Uh, firing on all cylinders. They came out. Kyrie Irvin had a great game, one of the best games I've seen him ever play. Um, LeBron James' shot was on, but he's not a shooter. He's not really anything. He's just a big guy that plays plays forward in the NBA. Uh, he's a prima donna, if you ask me. Uh, That's debatable he, to a few, I would say. Absolutely. You know, people have differing opinions about him, but I think that he's not really as good of a player as everyone says he is. He's uh, not a Michael Jordan. Definitely not a Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan was six of six in finals appearances. And LeBron is? Six of two, so, or two of six, yeah, rather. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so game three was do or die for the Cavs. They had to have that game. Without that game, they're down 3-0. I mean, the statistics in that is, is pretty unlikely for a comeback. But was it more about the Cavs finally stepping up, or was it more that the Warriors were just having an off night? 
I think it was kind of a combination of both because you saw um, the Cavs played really well, even without Kevin Love in there, um, which was surprising. In fact, well, what has he really done, you know, up until this point of him leaving? Well, he's a shooter. He spreads out the floor a little bit, and he hasn't been making his shots in the finals, but in the playoffs so far, he's played very well for the most part. Um, the Kyrie Irvin basically set the tone for the game early, early on. I think he had 18 points in the in the first quarter. He had as many points as the entire team of the Warriors. So it's hard to say that LeBron would have been the one to set the pace when it was actually uh, Kyrie. He was he was out there playing solid defense, handling the ball well, not causing turnovers. Not doing what he did in the first two games. Not doing what he did in the first two games, absolutely. And Steph and uh, Thompson, they had zero points in the first in the first quarter, none. Yeah. I mean, that's very unlike them. It was uncanny. At one point, Steve Kerr, the coach of the Warriors, actually turned to Steph and asked, are you all right? And he said, yeah, but he, did he didn't look all right. He looked like he was out of it, like uh, like something was going on outside of the, the, the game itself. Um, I've never seen him play like that, and I've been watching him since his college years at Davidson. Uh, he's His jump shot was completely off. He didn't score. I think his first basket was in the third quarter, so – it's pretty hard to say that Steph was even half of what he is normally. Not the MVP status that we're used to seeing from him. Definitely not the MVP quality uh, player. Um, you know, last year he had the opportunity to win the MVP and win the finals MVP, but Iguodala took it from him. And I, I just wonder, is he just not an uh, overperformer in the finals? Is it something that he's got a kind of a block to? He played well last year, but... You know, Iguodala stole the show and won well, and the that goes into the finals. The depth that they have. Iguodala wasn't even a starter throughout the whole season, you know, and then they put him in as a starter last year and he ends up winning MVP for the finals, you know, and, and the Cavs just don't seem to have that matchup with their bench that the Warriors have in their bench. Uh, the Cavs took advantage of the one stat that was kind of gleaming for them out of the first two games uh, coming into game three. They had a plus one margin in scoring when they had their big lineup out. So in game three, they actually started. Uh, Mozgov. Mozgov and uh, Jefferson. Jefferson hasn't started a game in three or four years since he was with the Pistons, and he's out there starting with the Cleveland Cavaliers in the NBA Finals at, what, 38 years old? I he's mean, that's a veteran of the game. He's definitely a veteran. I, I would say he's he's on point to uh, retire at any point now. So. Is he just waiting for that ring? I think that that was his idea of coming to the Cavaliers, was trying to get the opportunity to win a ring. Um, so, And he has a chance. I mean, they're in the Finals, and anybody has a chance at that point. Um, so I, uh, even though the games look close with the Warriors leading only by one, um, at this point, in my opinion, it's still Golden State Series. It's still their championship to win. What do the Cavs need to do to overcome this obstacle and, and steal this championship away from the defending champs? Well, I think, you, I mean, you made a good point in the fact that they are the defending champions. They won last year against this same team. I'm sure the team was a little bit more injured last year without Kyrie Irving and it, it was all on LeBron's shoulders to win the win the series for them, um, but and Love was out again last year too. Yeah, well, he's out again now, so it's kind of a non-factor as far as that goes. It's a wash in that aspect. But the the fact that Golden State has been playing so well, the only way I can see Cavaliers doing well is if if LeBron and Kyrie have an absolutely s amazing performance throughout the series. Also, if they can keep the turnover margin down. That'll be a dramatic factor, too, because Golden State's really good at creating turnovers. Their bench is, comes in and plays very well on defense, so they can uh, cause turnovers. And all they need is a couple threes, and they can basically put a dagger in anyone's back and just take the take the breath out of any arena. It's it's fun to watch when you're watching Golden State. Um, but how whatever they did to Steph Curry yesterday, if they can repeat that performance, too, and Clay Thompson at that. Sometimes it looked like they were just shooting him up with a hope and a prayer that it was going to go in. It's not the old school basketball that you're used to seeing where you take it to the rim and, and, you, and you look for that contact. You know, now sometimes it just seems they're just their only game is the threes. And when that doesn't work, it kind of seems that everything else kind of falls apart. Well, you can make the same argument for Cleveland because throughout the playoffs they were shooting more threes than they've ever shot ever in their franchise history. In the Eastern Conference. But they're still in the Eastern Conference. They're playing against, you know, solid teams, and they have, they have to perform no matter what they're playing against. You know, any team can win at any given day. Um, the fact that that um, that LeBron was on with his jump shot, which is not a normal occasion. He's he's a streaky shooter, and anyone that's watched him throughout his career can tell that for sure. There's no there's no telling what will happen overall. But if they can shut down Steph Curry and along with that Clay Thompson, then they have a chance. 
but that's the only chance they have. But then uh, they have to shut down everyone else. Livingston, the Barn, Iguodala. They got to shut all those guys down too because they seem to step up when the Stars can't take their step up. Well, one of the big things too for Cleveland was that uh, Tristan Thomas, he came off the he, he came out and performed really well last uh, game. It was one of his better games in the playoffs ever. Um, and he was kind of a catalyst for the for the team to be moving forward and kind of built the momentum for him. Um, it's really important that the it's just one game and it's away. So I, I see them having no problem in coming back uh, in Golden State coming back and winning the series. So one thing Michelle and I can fully agree on is the fact that the Cavs absolutely have to find a way to take game four to back up the dominant performance they showed in game three. Or the question should be asked, what size rings do the Warriors wear? But when we come back, we'll be getting into more of the Mariners and what they need to do to keep the path of chasing their own rings. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to BTC Sportsline. Well, Ray, I think anyone that knows you knows your deep passion for Mariners baseball. And the Mariners this season have had the hottest start since 2002. I know it's still early in the season, but what are your thoughts on having a team above the 500 mark so far at this point in the year? I absolutely love it. Uh, the Mariners have been playing very well. Uh, they've exceeded the expectations of myself and a lot of other people out there. Um, when they came in and they kind of gutted the whole team and restarted over, it's been, it's, it kind of scared me as it's a fan. It's been a roller coaster ride a little yeah, bit. Absolutely. You know, um, you know I, I always think when they start trading away players and try to rebuild a team that they're going to just have to start over from scratch and it's a five-year rebuilding plan. And well, the Mariners are beyond a rebuilding plan. They, they have the haven't players. had, yeah, they have core players that are great, but they can't even seem to even they have high expectations like last season and then they come out and they just falter um. I think last season them and the Nationals were on paper supposed to make the World Series yeah that, before the season even started they had them doing that. the two and teams that have never made the World Series were supposed to meet in the World Series so I think fans just want it that bad oh, I think that it's it's due time that you know Seattle sports fans have an opportunity to love their Mariners again there I mean, we've always loved our Mariners, though. Absolutely. Since I was a kid and my parents used to take me to the ballpark, I mean, I've, I've loved watching Alvin Davis and Harold Reynolds and all these guys back in the day. They've uh, kind of shaped my sports love, essentially. Uh, baseball is where it all started for me. Um, I can agree more. So seeing the, seeing the team come out and perform, um, perform better than their expectations. Uh, I mean, Taiwan Walker, I've always I've been really big on him since he started his career, and I was hoping that Jack Z didn't trade the guy, which is one of the things we always seem to do is trade away our good pitching when they're young. Um, but I see him in the future being our number two, possibly even our number one. Um, not to say that Felix is done at any point here, but... Well, speaking on our pitching, um, it's been a little bit inconsistent this year. You know, we've had some flashes of greatness from Walker and Carnes and Miley, but, you know, there's also been that followed by, you know, 14-run games given up by them. So is that a concern for you? Not really. Uh, baseball, it's, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Um, pitchers are going to lose games. Pitchers are going to get hit on. Uh, it's going to happen. Um, but what you, what you take away from it is when you see a game like last night with Taiwan Walker, best performance what of his career game. beautiful uh, 11 strikeouts one walk um, three base hits in eight innings of shutout baseball it's amazing watching him pitch like that um, not only that his pitches were better than they ever have been before he was pitching 92 miles per hour just the other the other day against uh, Texas and he was out on the mound throwing 97 mile per hour fastballs and you know that five miles per hour makes a dramatic difference at the plate I mean you can't it's scary to see a 97 mile per hour fastball when you're up there. We just had that uh, that pitcher get called up, Diaz, and um, I believe he was throwing 100 mile per hour balls when he made his debut. Yeah, he came from Double A ball all the way up into the to the Mariners. Now, how often does that happen? It's a pretty rare occasion. I mean, it has happened, but he's a really young player, so they wanted him to develop. But he was a starting pitcher just just recently um, in Double A ball, and they changed him to a reliever. And yeah, he's coming out of the bullpen throwing 100, 101 miles per hour. Like that's insane. Uh, you get a couple pitchers that throw over 90, over 95 miles per hour, and then your bullpen's throwing 100 miles per hour. As as a team, an opposing team, they have to be intimidated by that coming out. Um, Absolutely. You know, it'd be crazy if we had you know a a good changeup pitcher to mix in there too. So now you got changeup and these huge fastballs that are coming out. I mean, it's it's crazy. You never know what you're going to get from the Mariners, but. The run support's been there, which is the key for the Mariners. Um, I think I heard a stat that they were like 26 and nine when they have 
four runs or more scored, which is which know, hasn't always been there in the previous years. Absolutely, we've had not. the pitching. It seemed, but we just haven't had that run support. It just seems like um, over the years, it seems like the better pitchers get less run support, which is kind of difficult but from a fan's kinda, perspective. You can kind of see that. You know, you're. Uh, baseball's a matchup game, so when Felix is pitching, we're usually playing against the ace of the other team. So, you know, it makes sense that the run support might not be there, although, you know, you'd like to see your offense come through for your ace. Yeah, it's, uh, it's you know, Felix, when he goes out, you're only, their opposing teams usually only going to score one to two runs at the most, you know. Um, there has been some games this season where he's, he's let him score even more than that, but um, it's pretty uncommon overall throughout his career. So, you know, just getting a few runs here and there, um, but the Mariners' willing to, willingness to win, it seems like it's uh, it's bigger than it has been in years you past. You can feel it. It just feels different. You feel the energy. They're not out of a game. When they're down two or three runs and they're going in the seventh or and eighth ten, inning. Or ten runs. Or ten runs. Yes, that was a beautiful comeback. That was amazing. Uh, uh, I unfortunately missed the end of the game. I had to watch replays of it. But it was yeah, that works. It was an amazing game. Uh, there was something like nine for ten and with runners in scoring position. I think with like two outs, too. Yeah. I mean, that's that's just incredible. The, the greatest comeback the rally, in the history of the franchise. Yeah, the rally was incredible. It was. Uh, it would have been a great game to attend. Uh, I mean, the emotion and the passion you'd feel in the Not for the Padre stadium. fans, though. Oh, absolutely not. Uh, <laughs> you know, if I was an opposing team fan and I watched a team come back that many on us, as much as I'd be a, appalled by the collapse of my team, I'd be impressed by the other team either way. Hit um, after hit after hit. If an opposing team pitcher came in and threw a perfect game against us, I would be impressed and I would applaud that pitcher too. So, I mean, you just got to take it for what That's it's worth. That's just respect for the game that you have, though. Absolutely. and it's, Anyone could admire that. It's Well, things like that just don't occur, so it's important to you know, take them in and enjoy them for what they are. Um, now, uh, the Mariners just recently lost their first road series of the season. That's kind of unheard of to say this far into the season, but we did get swept by the Rangers, a division rival, but we do have a chance to bounce back. We have another series against the Rangers coming this weekend, and uh, it's a home series. So how important is that for the Mariners to try to, in, in turn, sweep the Rangers? Well, I mean, the fact that they just lost their, just got swept their first series away is amazing. We're a third of the way through the season. Um, it's pretty much unheard of for a team to play that well on the road. We were leading the majors in, in road wins. Uh, now to come back home, uh, unfortunately for, I'd never like to see an injury in the league, but you know, Adrian Beltre just went down. Their ace pitcher just went down for Texas. So they have a lot of obstacles to overcome in the near future. Beltre actually hurt the same leg um, last season and he was out for 30 days. Uh, he's not getting any younger. Is he gonna be 30 days, 60 days? Um, he's a very tough guy. He doesn't come out of a game unless he's seriously injured. Uh, well, speaking on injuries, we've dealt with some injuries ourselves with Felix and, and Marte and Martin. But with bringing in DePoto in the offseason and him kind of revamping this Mariners, how does the depth that he's provided um, help this team uh, power through these injuries? Well, I think that, I mean, it's been a big loss to lose some of these players when they're so hot. Uh, Cattell Marte was on fire. Uh, he had like a nine-game hitting streak coming into coming into before he got injured. Um, and then Leonis Martin was one of the best hitters in baseball, coming up very clutch for us in many, many games before he went down as well. Um, but the nice thing about it is they brought in a lot of, a lot of young talent. Um, we see in like our AAA Tacoma, I mean, we have great talent down there. We still have, we have definitely Boog, Boog, Powell. Boog Powell, young up and comer. Uh, we have Stefan Romero, we have, you know. Uh, Some fans would say yay or nay on Stefan. He, he had a home run in the major, so there I mean. There we go, okay. He's leading, leading AAA baseball in home runs, I think, still at this point. Um, but I mean, just to see that there's so much depth in the system itself, not just in, not just at, uh, in the roster at the Mariners level, but in the AAA. And I mean, we're bringing pitchers up from AA. I mean, that's right, amazing. Right, that, I, I don't think I can remember a time where that happened. I can't remember a pitcher ever. Yeah, well, Diaz seems to have it, though, and yeah. I'm excited to have him on board. Yeah, me too. And with uh, taking, talking on the subject of cleaning house, such as DePoto has done with the M's, reminds me of another Seattle team that had similar actions taken when a new head coach and GM took over. That team has lots of new faces this year and some very promising young talent. We'll discuss the Seahawks OTAs when we come back. Stay tuned. You all right, Rob? Welcome back to BTC Sportsline. Before we can come to a close, it wouldn't be a show without the mention of the Seahawks and what they have going on with their off-season workouts. Ray, we have some pretty promising young talent on board with our Hawks, and while it's still all on paper at this moment, 
What are your thoughts on the young stars in the making? Well, first off, I think that the Seahawks did the right thing in addressing some of their needs when they were in the offseason, in the draft, as well as in free agency. Um, they picked up offensive and defensive linemen, which is... Duran Reed and uh, Jermaine Effetti. Yes. Which is kind of hard to, you know, say how they'll pan out because in OTAs and in rookie minicamp, no pads, no contact. You can't really say what an uh, offensive or defensive lineman will do when a game time comes. It's true that the until they get the pads on and are actually blocking people or try to break through blocks, you can't really tell. Um, but you know their college college careers do speak a lot for the volumes for them overall, um, and they have the prototypical bodies and builds and athletic talent that you would want from those type of positions, which is great. Oh, some positions we can speak more on, like um, our rookie running backs. I've heard a lot about C.J. Procise and Alex Collins. What are your thoughts on them backing up Thomas Rawls this coming season? Well, you know, with uh, Pete Carroll, his theory on always compete, they might not be backing up. They might be splitting carries even. Um, they're both great talents out of college. Uh, they both had big-time roles in their universities, um, and they're coming out to a, to a team that, you know, we saw a lot of Rawls last year, but he went down with injury. We don't know what we're going to get out of our running backs at this point. Um, and we don't know who's going to start. Um, we know that Marshawn Lynch isn't going to start. We know Marshawn Lynch isn't going to start, unfortunately. We all miss you. Um, but the the fact that ProSize has been kind of projected as being a third down back, taking some of the work that, um, that Jackson had last year uh, is something that we hope to see. Um, he's a bigger back. He runs a little bit. Uh, he runs north and south. And he looks pretty darn good in the open field. And, you know, Pete Carroll does have that always compete, you know, so that you can never write anyone out. You can never say, well, they got their shot and they didn't make it. So speaking on that, what are your thoughts on Christine Michael maybe making the 53-man roster? Well, Christine Michael, as far as physical ability, and he's a great player. Um, unfortunately, he can't hold on to a ball. You can't That's hold on. important. Yeah, you can't hold on to a ball in this league. You're not going to play ball. That's all there is to it. Um, he's been on multiple teams since leaving the Seahawks and then coming back because of injuries we've had to kind of take him on but it's something that overall I don't really see him being part of the team maybe the practice squad who knows but he's already been on the practice squad I think for two different teams so doesn't that make him yeah, ineligible yeah he'd be disqualified so for this that is kind of his last shot like this is his make or break maybe we can make him look good in the preseason and trade him to somebody else try that route for again. a seventh round draft pick eh, you take what you can get absolutely right? speaking of seventh round draft pick uh, we recently acquired a wide receiver by the name of Kenny Lauer, 6'3", uh, 203 pounds, and he's been making a lot of noise in rookie minicamp. I think he's one of the most interesting rookies that we have coming out this season. Um, he is a wide receiver with amazing talent, amazing physical attributes, uh, a little bit smaller than you'd like to see in some of the some of the wide receivers, but he reminds me of a Tyler Lockett-style player, a little bit taller, though. Um, He's a seventh round draft pick. He's been underestimated. But, you know, he comes out of Cal where the their, their quarterback, Goth, was what, the number two pick number overall? One number pick one pick to, overall. Uh, the Los Angeles Rams. Which a lot of times we find out whether it's the quarterback or the receiver that actually makes the team the way it is. But in his, his sophomore and uh, freshman season, he led the team in receptions as well as touchdown receptions. That's pretty impressive. And to see some of the catches this guy makes in practice and in these OTAs, uh, it's amazing. He, he's out there catching balls like uh, Calvin Johnson or something. He could do a Doug Baldwin catch when he did last season where he reached up and that made a T-shirt about it. I think. Yes, yeah. absolutely. I think, he'll do, I think he'll do really good next to the Doug Baldwin. Um, I mean, we have the depth at wide receiver. We have Jermaine Curse. We have Baldwin. I mean, you could make an argument that Jimmy Graham is a wide receiver. We have Lockett. I mean, we could just keep going on. Yeah. And so, you know, it'll be nice to get that big-bodied wide receiver in there competing for, for more catches from Russell Wilson. I think that it's a, it's a really big thing for the Seahawks because they're going to be able to switch up their, their play calls quite a bit this season. If they do split Jimmy Graham out, like you were mentioning, out as a wide receiver, you know, they could put five wide out, and then they got a one running back and a mobile quarterback. You can't cover everybody on the field all at one time. So worst case scenario, you're going to get Wilson running for, you know, five to ten yards or Rawls or whoever's there. So it's the sky's the limit for the Seahawks. I can't wait to see what happens this season. I'm excited. I think there's like, what, 96 days? I, Last something. I mean, who's counting really, though? Yeah, right? I think it is 96 days, okay. but it, but right. who is counting? But, uh, me and you, Yeah, apparently. that's true. That's true, yeah. 
Well, thank you to everyone for tuning in to this week's episode of BTC Sportsline. This time of year, sports is changing and entertaining us daily. With some teams in the race for that trophy and other teams in training for it, we are here to give you all the updates and keep you in the know for whatever is calling our line, the sports line. Myself and Ray, thank you, and we will see you next time.